Hi, I'm Kit Kowalski, and today I'm going to be doing an unscripted reaction video to one of the first videos that introduced me to the modern transgender phenomenon. This is Paula Stone Williams giving a TED talk on what it's like to have lived as a man and as a woman. All right, let's get into it and play the video. of a national television show. I preach in medicine. So my really my first comment here is when I hear this kind of curriculum vitae, I think the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. So obviously this man has had some very big shoes to fill and uh, he has you know been like nationally successful an executive, a high flyer on television. Um, you know, it, it's not out of the realms of possibility that um, there was no room for difference or uh, experimentation or free expression in his life. And so when he's creating this woman persona, you know, it, it, it's not, it doesn't, it's not surprising that his reaction to living this, uh, you know, very successful life is to have created an opposite persona. I was a successful, well-educated, white, American male. He still is all of those things. The poet and mystic Thomas Merton said, it's a difficult thing to climb to the top of the ladder of success, only to realize when you get there, that your ladder's been leaning against the wrong wall. So, I mean, a few things here. Like, firstly, how would his climb to the ladder of success been different if he was a woman the whole time? So, um, you know, what, what wall was, should he have been leaning against? Was it... Uh, not corporate America? Was it not the religious institutions he worked for? Should he have been at home baking the whole time? And in what way did his sexed body stop him from achieving the goal that maybe he realises that he should have been pursuing the whole time? And in what way does having a midlife crisis, because that's what is being described here is you know working for um you know 30 or 40 years and then looking back and realizing oh actually maybe um I, you know i've been very successful but i could have been achieving something else how does having a midlife crisis mean that he's not a man i knew from the time i was three or four years of age i was well firstly nobody gets to choose and secondly if a three or four year old knows quote that they're transgender that means that somebody has told them about transgenderism and that they've been groomed three and four year olds are still working out how to go to the toilet by themselves so they are not uh, contemplating on the nature of their sex bodies and their sex roles within society. In terms of choosing, well, you don't get to choose your body, but you definitely get to choose the clothes that you wear, the length of your hair, and how you interact with others. You know, not all men go on to be a big corporate success in uh, mega churches, <laughs> and not all women, um, well, I don't know what is Paula Stone doing now that he is, uh, quote unquote, a woman. He's still preaching. He's doing a TED talk. He's flying around the country uh, preaching. So his life actually is not that different. I thought a gender fairy would arrive and say, okay, the time has come. There is actually an Australian book called The Gender Fairy. And uh, it's written by one of these uh, Transhausen's mums. And 
people are actually telling children these days that there is a gender fairy. But alas, no gender fairy. I just did my job. I didn't sleep in today. So I was a boy. How did he know that he wasn't a boy? Oh, that's really my only question there. How? All things that women do as well. But the call toward authenticity has all the subtlety of a smoke alarm. Does it? I mean, people go through their entire lives making compromises. And, you know, people, <laughs> people have deathbed uh, uh, confessions and deathbed regrets because the call toward authenticity is not crystal clear a lot of the time and in fact the desire to do something doesn't mean that it is an authentic thing to do so you know from a personal perspective in my life i am called towards doing so many different activities and the fact that i choose one over the other doesn't make one of them more authentic or and one of them inauthentic it just means it's the one that I chose to put my energy into. This is trying to establish a narrative that he had no choice in the matter, even though throughout his life he chose, he supposedly has known since age three or four, uh, he has chosen to continue living his life. He has chosen to go to school. He has chosen to go to college. He has chosen to get married. He has chosen to get a job in the mega church on television preaching something that he supposedly doesn't believe in somehow. Um, and all that time he was supposedly living an inauthentic life. This is making a big excuse for him to turn around and say, actually, I'm allowed to burn down my life. I'm allowed to get divorced from my wife even though I'm a Christian and I've professed this Christian faith. And that's one of the core tenets of, of the Christian faith is uh, lifelong marriage. You know, I'm allowed to put the relationship that I have with my children in jeopardy. I'm allowed to, um, you know, have these, uh, like possibly embarrass my employers who don't necessarily see transgenderism in their their worldview because they're faith-based corporations. This supposed inexorable call toward authenticity is his excuse. And eventually a decision has to be made. So I came out as transgender and I lost all of my jobs. All of his jobs. How many jobs do you have? How many of them are at corporate mega churches preaching on the television? How much money do you think this guy was worth before he decided to start giving TED TEDx talks? I have never had a bad review, and I lost every single job. In 21 states, you can't be fired for being transgender. But in all 50, you can be fired if you're transgender and you work for a religious corporation. Actually, what he's talking about here is alignment of values. So religious organizations, rightly or wrongly, do get exemptions from some of these protected characteristics in employment law because they want people to work for them who are aligned with their values. Like it's very simple. You know, if you, and as uh, if you're somebody who, is using the services of, that were provided by a Catholic organization, for example, you would, want, you would expect the people that you go to who are serving you would be aligned with the values of the Catholic faith. You would expect that they would understand what you're going through as a Catholic. Um, you know, and similarly for any religion, rightly or wrongly, this is not about transgenderism. This is about the... Um, the exemptions that are provided to religious organizations, right? And it applies across the board. 
This is not about him. Again, if he'd known he was transgender since age three or four, why did he pursue this career path? Surely he knew that this would place him in eventual jeopardy when the call toward authenticity was getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Yet he's continued to build the career in the corporate megachurches. Again, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. Why wouldn't he have compromised somewhere along the line and went and got a job at Nike or Qantas or I guess he's American, but you know, at American Airways or any other corporation? It's not easy being a transgender. People sometimes ask, do you feel 100% like a woman? I'm really keen to know the answer. So again, like, what is it to be transgender? How can he claim that he's a woman? He's not actually answered that question. Do you feel 100% like a woman? I'm sure he feels like he feels 100% like a woman. But he hasn't actually told us what a woman is, what a transgender person is, and why he's entitled to be giving us this information. No, but you could speak for yourself and you haven't done that. I feel 100% like a transgender. That's a man. There are things a cisgender woman knows I don't know. Yeah, like what it's like to be a woman. That said, I am learning a lot about what it means to be a woman. Right, like Wikipedia or, you know, you, you're allowed to learn a lot. You can, anyone can learn a lot about what it's like to be a woman or a man or what it's like to be an elephant. And, you know, do you know that dogs only see in black and white? That's really amazing. I've learned something about what it's like to be a dog. <laughs> that doesn't make me a dog. It makes me someone who has access to some particular knowledge. your current gender. I have the unique experience of having lived life from both sides. No, you have the not so unique experience of having lived life wearing pants and then having lived life wearing pants that don't really have pockets in them. That's not the same thing as living life as a man and as a woman. differences are massive. Yeah, I mean, are they really? <laughs> you know, we, we live in a very, um, in, in a very equal society, actually. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess I'll leave that there. Wow, there's a lot of like applauding going on from the audience. So what is it that we think we're going to find out here? What are the women going to find out that they don't already know about what it's like to live life as a woman? What are the men going to find out about what it's like to live life as a man? I know it's so cute like this is this is a great crowd pleaser you know pockets <laughs> um, women's pockets uh, women's clothing in general is tailored to be quite fitting and revealing and pockets are bulky and putting things in your pockets make them bulky and it spoils the look so you'll often get women's clothes that have no pockets, that have tiny pockets, or that have pockets that are functional but have been sewn shut so that they lie flat. This isn't actually an intrinsic quality to being a woman though. Like, you know, and especially as a man with a man's body, 
he totally has the option of just wearing men's pants. Like I personally can't wear men's pants because my hips are the wrong shape for most men's clothing. Um, but he totally has the option and I don't see why he wouldn't take advantage of it if the women's clothing was, was substandard for his purposes. But it's a great crowd pleaser because every woman is going to say, oh yes, that's exactly right. Pockets, so hard to carry things around. Of course, you know, we all have choices, right? The fact that we um, choose to keep buying these tailored garments um, you know, that's a choice that we make. You put a phone in there. Paper clip, maybe. But like women carry purses as well. And the reason we carry purses is because firstly, we want to carry more than just, I mean, a wallet, like, you know, we want to be prepared for a lot of different occasions. No, um, no, no talking about why that is we feel a need to be prepared, whether or not that's social or whether or not that's an intrinsic biological, like, um, capability of females to, you know, always have all the tools available for any situation. <laughs> um, yeah. No, no, they don't. We all know that. What is a double zero? It's the smallest size available. And ladies, I doubt you know this, but did you know there is never a time in the life of a male that he has to worry about whether or not an article of his clothing is accidentally going to drop into the toilet? Like, to be fair, I don't tend to worry about this much either. Uh, and that's because when I get dressed in the morning, I secure my clothing. Uh, or if there's something I'm wearing like a scarf, when I go to the toilet, I will like leave it at my desk or I will take it off and put it onto the hook. Uh, this isn't really, this doesn't have a lot to do. There's not a lot of substance here. There's not a lot not to do with what it's like to be a woman. This is what it's like to go shopping in America. This is what it's like to, you know, if you're being dressed by the corporate fashion houses. <laughs> and as Paula demonstrates, these are concerns that men share as well. He's a man and he has these, he has these concerns with pockets and with clothing sizes and articles dropping into the toilet. You know, this is not about being a woman. Not a long sweater, not a belt, nothing. Never even a passing thought. I love how it sort of cuts to these women who are like wearing sweatshirts and stuff and they actually don't look like anything of theirs is going to drop into the toilet. <laughs> Right, okay, so this is about your hair being long versus being short. Um, so men go to the barber very often because they want to have short haircuts. When I have a short haircut, I go and get my haircut very, very often to keep it looking really neat. And it doesn't take the stylist very long and they don't charge me very much for it. Whereas longer hair to dress and to style it takes longer they often need to treat the hair and um, I don't know if you're getting a color or something they will charge you a lot more for it like I mean this is not about being a man or being a woman so I can go on vacation or I can get my hair cut I cannot do both or you could grow your hair or you could get it cut as an, I mean, you know, <laughs> he just said 
he got his hair cut like much less frequently that it costs more so surely those small frequent um, outlays are going to add up to the same as the one you know the once a year haircut cost like I don't know I was speaking to a woman a few years ago and she got her hair done once a year and it was this big involved procedure she had very long very colored hair and uh, she said it cost her a thousand dollars once a year and we sat down and I added up what I spent on my hair just going and getting it maintained versus what she spent on her hair and it was kind of equivalent you know like it it was there it wasn't as uh, she just paid once <laughs> Do you? What could that even mean? Bumping into gender differences. Sometimes what does that mean? There's like a gender difference that you actually run into? I'm walking down the hallway and I just bump into it. Into it? What? What is it? There's nothing in the way. What is he talking about? And I just bumped into it. I just just thought of that and I know it's going to leave a bruise. A bruise? He's talking about bumping into gender differences. And then he segues into it's going to leave a bruise. Is he trying to say that women are clumsy? Because now that my skin is thinner, I have bruises absolutely everywhere. So thinning skin is a side effect of the aging process. I don't think that it's an artifact of whether or not you're male or female. Um, it's possible that the hormones he may be taking are causing him to be susceptible to bruising, but he's also clearly at an age where his skin is visibly thinner, even on the video. Um, so I would definitely expect him to be bruising more often just because of his his age it, this that was a really weird segue I bump into gender differences literally and it leaves a bruise I feel like he's trying to say he's trying to reify and make tangible the idea of these gender differences he's trying to actually say that they're real and it seems almost like he's subconsciously trying to convince us that he's not making it up. Now I experience my sexuality profoundly. Whoa, what a segue. That was that came out of the blue and was unexpected and absolutely not required. Um, okay, so it, this is like an age old question of do men and women experience sex and sexuality differently? Uh, you know, I suppose the common sense answer is they probably do, but there's another question on top of this, which is, does a man with long hair who shops at Target, Target women, and has little teeny tiny pockets in his pants, does he experience his sexuality profoundly differently to other men? Let's find out. It's not sweet and more horrific. Oh, right, because women aren't really erotic beings. Okay, <laughs> so this sounds very sexist right that you know men are very visually turned on very visually stimulated and women are you know we don't really mind one way or the other and our sexuality is holistic and you know orgasms are optional is often a feature of this belief that women aren't actually sexually you know sexual beings well actually we are 
and this conceptualization of women as being you know more of a whole body the sexual experience is really just an excuse to um you know just to be bad in bed No, no, no. Women experience sexuality in their bodies, okay? And it's not about being at all. <laughs> this could be because he's castrated himself with estrogen. I'm not really sure. But women, women's bodies are sexual and we experience sex in our bodies, in our genitals, and we experience orgasms. We don't experience a mystical state of being. That's not what our sexuality is. That's incorrect. I cannot tell the number of times I've been caught in the I just didn't know. But I didn't know. Yeah, because you didn't ask. I'm, you know, if you weren't satisfying your former wife, then that's really a failure of your relationship, your sexual relationship with your former wife. And frankly, putting it on her and apologizing and making her say, you know, oh, that's okay, dear, you didn't know. Or, you know, you weren't to know. That's really, it's quite lugubrious. You know, I don't know how long they were married, but he's just kind of wimping out of an apology for, you know, what, decades of bad sex? where he just couldn't be bothered to say to his wife, hey, what do you like? Or how about, you know, we try something else? <laughs> um, it's not her fault. She can't, she can't, like, to actually put that on her and to apologize to her and say, oh, I'm so sorry. It's just the fact that I, I wasn't a woman yet and I didn't know how women's bodies worked. It's such a cop out. There are thousands, millions, possibly billions of men out there who can have satisfying heterosexual sex with women, like where the women are satisfied. Right? The fact that you failed to do that is not because you weren't a woman or because you weren't wearing skinny jeans from Target. Oh, spare me. He can actually understand it. All right. So because a well-educated white male can talk to others, can read books, can read the news, can interpret data, they can absolutely understand it. This whole standpoint philosophy is really quite annoying. This idea that well, you actually don't know, and in fact, you can't do anything to address power imbalances unless you're actually in the standpoint of the victim. So, you know, from my perspective, I, I can't address any power imbalance. I may as well just give up now, right? Because I'm not in the standpoint of every single victim out there. No, as people, we have sympathy and we have empathy, right? We can understand, and beyond that, we have an intellectual capability to interrogate what someone is saying to us and to understand what they're saying to us. Even dispassionately, even if we do not have any sympathy or empathy for others, right? we can look at data and we can say, yes, this is fair or no, this isn't. Right? We can interrogate what's happening and the information that's coming into us. This is a complete cop out. This is the um, male privilege version of the, oh, I was bad in bed because I wasn't a woman yet. There's no way you can understand it because it's all he's ever known. No, again, it is a complete cop out to say this. This lets every single abuser off the hook. Every every single misogynist man off the hook, every single racist off the hook, 
everyone who's had a shitty childhood or a bad upbringing or you know their parents were any no this is a terrible argument no again he can change his viewpoint so imagine right that you are um you know you grow up in a really homophobic neighborhood and you start to think you might be attracted to the same sex okay so but homophobia is all you've ever known and supposedly all you ever will know does that mean that you can't you cannot break out and go and pursue your life and your desires as a same-sex attracted individual no it absolutely doesn't mean that okay we have the power to take on new information and we have the power to change our minds and we have the power to change the minds of those around us as well social change happens because there are people out there changing their minds and changing their viewpoint and taking on data right and deciding yeah actually there are better ways we could do things yeah we can understand it because we actually see it happening we see men being treated differently and more favorably than what we're treated um you know this this does happen and it's well documented as women we can absolutely see it the only reason that uh, men tend not to see it is because their needs are being satisfied and they're not interrogating the reasons why our needs are not being satisfied whereas you know if your needs are being satisfied you spend a lot of time wondering why It's more than an inkling. Uh, we can actually see it happening. And especially when it's happening to you, it's not just an inkling or a feeling or a mystical knowledge. We can actually see what is happening. We can, you know, we can see that we have been passed over or we can see that we're not being listened to in the workplace, right? I'm really lucky to live in a time where sexism is better than it used to be but it's still there 100 percent i'm here to tell you if she has no idea how much harder it is for her than it is for the guy in the brooks brothers jacket in the office across the hall yeah we actually do know so we can see because we can look at the work that we're doing the quality of work that we're doing and we can look at our advancement in our career paths, okay? What he's not gonna talk about, I'm just gonna wager here, he's not gonna talk about um, maternity. He's not gonna talk about women who have career breaks to have babies and to breastfeed. Because that would mean admitting that there is a biological difference between men and women and um, that that would mean that he's not a woman. I know. I was that. You still are that guy. You're just wearing Target skinny jeans. And I thought I was going to get stuck. I mean, like, you probably were a really nice guy. Like, you probably still are a really nice person. <laughs> You know what what is it with all of this like whipping yourself and um you know man bad woman good what what is with that why do you need to repent or is it possibly because you were brought up in and grew up to be a, a proponent of uh, this faith that believes in good and bad you know good and evil the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. So, you know, he thought he was the good guy and he wants to move away from that image of himself. So now he has to construct this new image of 
Paula, woman, woman good, man bad. Because otherwise, why would he be moving away from it? Like you've never flown as a female. You... <laughs> you you've never flown as a female. You've flown as a man. You are continuously a man. That's... So I've flown over 2.3 million miles. Wow, good for you. American Airlines. I know my way around an airplane. Um, so does that mean that, you know... <laughs> Like when somebody tells me that they've they've flown a lot, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, like what do your family think about that? So this harks back a little bit to my ex-wife, Kathy. Um, was he at home that much? Like is this new persona someone who is is going to be able to be at home, to be available for the family, to actually have these like full fulsome relationships? Is that part of what this transformation is about? And America does great with their passengers, but that does not mean they're passengers. Yeah, those bigots. The first time I flew with Paula, I was going from Denver to Charlotte. And I got on the plane and then was stuck in one seat. So I picked it up and then I sat down. Why would you touch another person's stuff? Like, I mean, I get it that you're a man who's very confident in an aircraft, but why would you, like, be touching somebody's stuff? It, it just seems like a really weird move for me. Um, you know, surely maybe you would just pick it up and put it into the next seat or something, but I wouldn't be caught dead holding somebody else's things while I was in an aircraft. And a guy said, that's my stuff. See, a lot of the women in the audience are kind of like laughing now at recognition of, you know, the good old mansplaining. Um, you know, it, and there's a whole altercation. It has a flavor of maybe things that didn't happen. You know, um, the first time he flew as Paula and somebody tags him as lady, lady, that's my stuff. I don't know. At this point in the altercation, surely you would get your ticket out and say, actually, this is my seat. Stop holding strangers' stuff. It's just weird. So again, like, you know, we've got all the mansplaining and stuff going on here. Why is he engaging in this altercation with this man? At this point, the guy behind me said, lady. Another man has called him lady? Really? Would you take your effort marking out there until I can get to you? I absolutely stop. I would never. Okay, like, yeah, you were just then treated like that as a male. He's trying to construct this as being, maybe this is his penance for, you know, transitioning, quote unquote, into a woman. You know, that, well, women are pure and good and, you know, they have this, like, sexuality that's not a real sexuality and everything. But as a penance for that, they um, they get treated really badly by men on aircraft. I don't know. <sighs> He's trying to construct this as being something that just routinely happens to women. And yes, women do get spoken down to, etc. But this is simply one instance where he's doing some really weird out of bounds behavior 
by like just touching a stranger's things on an aircraft and then having an altercation with the stranger instead of simply showing his ticket, sitting down and saying, yeah, look, this is where I'm going to sit or, hey, why don't you take the window this time? I don't really care. Um, you know, he's, he's actually involved himself in an argument and he's making it out like this is what women face every day. It's really not. Yeah, did it though? The guy would have looked at his boarding pass. Why didn't you look at your boarding pass? You know, why was no one referring back to reality? This is quite annoying to me at the moment because um, he's using this example where he didn't refer to the boarding pass, right? He wanted the other guy to do it. He wanted the other man to defer to him. And the man didn't defer. And so he's constructing it as an argument about sexism in America. Like the, 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 the sexist part here is that the other man didn't defer immediately. The rest of it is just the stuff that happens when you start an argument with someone on an aircraft, <laughs> when, you, when everybody's really tetchy and wants to take off. And the mind reading here, this, what would have happened if he was a man, what would have happened is you actually don't know what would have happened. So, like, he's got women looking out for him. And this is a common feature, I think, of transgender males is that they they will accumulate a little crew of women who protect them. Um, I've even seen this uh, as like advice that was given um, for men who want to, to use the women's toilets at workplaces is the advice was literally find one of your friends who's a woman and ask if you can go to the toilet with her. Because, you know, obviously if somebody's your friend, they're going to, they're going to, like you and help you and want you to succeed whether or not you wear a skirt or pants or you have long hair or short hair right but these women these are the ones who hold open the door and these are the ones who are letting men into women's vulnerable spaces so he's got himself some women who are supporting him who are going out of their way for him. I told her and she said, yeah. Welcome to the world of women. Oh yeah, that's right. Because like women, being a woman is, you know, just such a horrible thing, right? <laughs> I really feel like he's trying to construct this as like a penance, you know, that that he's doing this thing and it's not really benefiting him at all. It's definitely not a fetish. It's definitely not, you know, sexually motivated because his sexuality is a whole body experience. What is it? It's not a body experience. It's a being experience now. Um, it's, it's definitely not something he enjoys and being a woman's actually quite crap. So why would you want to do it? Oh, it must be the call towards authenticity. He's just gaslighting the audience here. No, because you're a man. Because you spent all of those years uh, getting the, the privilege of 
being a man and you're continually a man. And even now, so I have had long hair and short hair. I have worn skirts and trousers, right? Do you think I could get a TEDx talk on what it's like to live both as a man and a woman? No, no. His male privilege is allowing him to get up there at a TEDx event, or multiple actually TEDx events, and fly all over the country talking about, quote, what it's like to be a woman. And he's only allowed to do that because he's a man. You haven't transitioned. You just went shopping at Target Women. A lot of decades of being a man. And many more to come. But that doesn't mean I don't see my powers in this situation. That tells you another thing. That's called getting older. Right? Remember how you lost all your jobs? You lost all your networks? You know? Um, <laughs> and you're getting older and your skin is thinner and you're being spoken down to an aircraft by, oh, were they younger men? I don't know. Interesting question. Um, but yeah, that's like, this is not because you're quote transgender, right? Or because you're quote a woman. It's simply because you've exited your circles of power and you're getting older. Um, as much as I'd love to comment on that, no comment. Yeah, I guess it's the loss of testosterone and the arrival of testosterone that has caused me to lose the brain cells necessary to be a fully functioning adult human. Adult human male. Either that or I'm as smart as I ever was. And so funny because you're actually mansplaining what it is to be a woman. <laughs> so I was in my local Denver bike shop and a young summer employee said, Can I help? And I said, Yeah, I came the spring of an older gay hooker now who has heart defects in Denver. I'm just going to bet that this is like a mansplaining episode. And, uh, yeah. So, look, I work in technology and like I'm always really annoyed when I need to call the help desk for something because the help desk need to go through their um, troubleshooting rubric right? Like it doesn't matter how smart you are or how much knowledge you already have. They need to say, have you tried turning it off and on? Have you tried doing X? Have you tried doing Y? Blah, blah, blah. And shop assistants in bike shops are kind of no different. Um, you know, they do need to go through the steps where they talk to you about the common problems, the problems not everyone knows about before you get to like, you know, imparting your special knowledge and what I do is I say to the tech people this is what's happened this is what I've done and I answer all their questions for them in advance I don't get shirty <laughs> like this guy is about to do I wonder if the shop assistants knew him beforehand because if you don't know someone, then you're going to assume, you really have to assume that they're not a technical expert. Whereas if it's someone that you have a prior relationship to, it's often easier to say, oh yeah, look, I know this person knows what they're talking about. And so I'm going to have a higher level conversation with them. But if you just walk in off the street and well, he did ask a really technical question, which is like the clue. But firstly, one, I would say, 
sometimes people Google that sort of stuff to sound smart. Secondly, it's possible the shop assistant himself didn't know and he's just trying to fall back on his basic knowledge and taking someone through the troubleshooting rubric. Yeah, I know a bent rotor. So again, like, you know, I get it. I get mansplaining. I get being, you know, techno babbled at. It's not very pleasant. But sometimes with these conversations, there really are two sides. And if you have a collaborative attitude, you can go and you can try to get the best out of the sales assistant or like the, the technician without like having a confrontation with them um, because they failed to recognize your genius. It just seems to me like this guy is getting upset because people aren't recognizing that he's a genius. And maybe he's actually, you know, he's not talking, he's not actually experiencing like a diminishing, you know, his diminishing power. He's just experiencing like, ordinary people not kowtowing to him. I don't know, maybe that is a diminishing of his male privilege. Okay, so <laughs> like we've just had this whole like um <laughs> where are we? We just had this this whole thing about um you know worshiping and male privilege and and then the first guy who comes along and speaks to you like a human being, you want to worship him? Like there's, there's a lack of reflexivity here. You know, someone's not really thinking things through. So on the one hand, I don't know, maybe it's, it's that Paula Stone doesn't actually think there's anything wrong with male privilege, right? I reckon it, it's possible that he does think that men should have privilege. It's probably because of the hair. I mean, sorry, it just, it's a bit weird. Three or four rounds with someone before I get a direct answer. Like, yeah, that's called having a conversation, right? If you're not used to that, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, d I don't know anyone who doesn't have to go through having a conversation in order to get the answer that they want. I'm possibly going to bet that this has also got something to do with his loss of social status as a television preacher as well. This is funny because he's actually gaslighting the rest of us. So he's talking to us as though we don't know what we're talking about, or what he's talking about, right? He's talking to us as though we don't know what it's like to be, to live as a man or as a woman, and that he's going to enlighten us and he's going to tell us. Um, and he's gaslighting us. Okay. Mm. You ever notice if a woman has been abusing her position and she knows she's right, she apologizes for it? 
<laughs> yeah, like we are socialized to apologize for making a fuss. Um, yeah, we, we are we are socialized to uh, to feel bad about interrupting and everything. I personally try not to do that, and it takes a bit of an effort, but you know it's worthwhile because at the end of the day, you need to get your point across and you need to advance yourself. So no one else is going to do that. I'm sorry, but I just think that you, uh, you know, you don't have to apologize for being right. Yeah, you don't. And thanks for mansplaining that to us. You're not new to the gender. You're still a man. You just went shopping at Target Women. I said, what are women looking for? She said, women are looking for men who will honor our religion. Who will realize our gifting is not less sacred, deeper, or more significant. It is, in fact, more consequential, and it's essential. I kind of like that, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's quite good, you know, not not different, uh, sorry, different, not the same, but of equal value. And it's essential, almost as if being a woman is, is an essential characteristic, almost as if being a woman is an adult human female. Oh my God. <laughs> so there are women, there are men, he may not be one of them, who honor women like my friend who honors me. Your good friend and pastor, Mark, I'm imagining is a really great person and is maybe a servant leader who wants to watch others succeed. And that's wonderful. But is him letting you lead evidence that he honours women? Why don't you honour and empower women by allowing women to, t to talk about what it's like to be a woman? So instead of coming up here and talking from your own personal experience, you could have maybe done a survey. You could have done some research and asked your ex-wife, Kathy, or your good friend or your other good friend, what is it like to be a woman? And you could have related their stories. But you're not. You're a man taking the place of women. Again with the bumping into, what do you think that means? What is he, what is he thanking women for exactly? You are an interloper. I mean, it's lovely that your friends accept you and that you feel that you're able to kind of get along in the world and everything, um, you know, from a personal standpoint. But you are an interloper. You're a man. And you're being allowed in women's spaces just on sufferance, you know. It's on the proviso that you behave yourself. And... What is the serious work of womanhood? What do you actually think of as the serious work of womanhood? 
men and women differ. The key difference between men and women is our reproductive capacity. You have declared your womanhood status later in life, okay, after you've already had children, after your wife actually engaged in the serious work of womanhood. What is it you're actually bringing to the table at this point, Paula? Oh my God, he's mansplaining to us again. Thank you so much, Paula, for giving us permission to be capable human beings. Why would men be feeling uncomfortable at this point? I mean, that's a really serious question. Like, so is it because that there, there's a man speaking to them about what it's like to wear women's clothes that don't have pockets? Um, or is it because there are men listening to a man talk about how he has to have a conversation if he wants to get technical advice about his bicycle. Uh. I do not wish to be I never thought I had privilege. But I did. You still do, as I pointed out earlier. You are a man, mansplaining to us about what it's like to be a woman and what you have tried to do is you've tried to divest yourself of your male privilege you haven't actually succeeded in this but you've tried to divest yourself of your male privilege and you've tried to assume the privileged position of someone who has a special knowledge of being a man and a special knowledge of being a woman Right, you're trying to um, assume the privilege of liminality. And so do you. What can you do? What can you do? Can we tell you that we might? And very heavy sell that you do not have equity. It is not a level playing field. It never has been. And yet, one of the key reasons that it's not a level playing field is because of women's actual, real, physical, biologically different bodies, which haven't been mentioned at all. You can give what you can by elevating us to equal footing. Elevating us? Is he trying to get his job back as a preacher? Yeah, I do think men have uh, have some power to like, you know, in society to stop, listen and um, treat others. Um, what would I say? To look out for others whose needs are not being met, even if their own needs are being met. So... Yeah, men could do a little bit more in that direction. Oh, this is getting a bit... I mean, my brown-skinned daughter? I don't know. It just seems creepy that he would say that. Okay, again, so <laughs> so again, this is like the standpoint philosophy, right? That you can't understand what it's like to be in somebody's shoes. You have no access to knowledge unless it is first-hand knowledge. And he is the only person who has the access to the first-hand knowledge of what it's like to be a man and what it's like to be a woman. This is patently not correct like as humans 
we do have access to knowledge about how, what happens outside of our own viewpoint. But he's co-opting race. It, it did just sound really creepy when he said my brown skinned daughter. Um, I, don't, I don't know why. Um, but he's co-opting the race argument, right? Um, and it's a little bit unsavory when we think about some of the atrocities that have been committed in the name of racial purity to to say that that's that's the same thing as a man who wants to wear jeans that don't have pockets in them I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard being a woman. It's hard being a lot of things, you know. It's actually quite quite good. I like it. <laughs> um, I don't think that we should say that... Um, I don't think we should be elevating positions on the basis that, like, oh, it's hard. You know, I think that we should be looking at what it is to be a woman and what women need in order to succeed, Well, you still don't know what you don't know, right? But you can take steps to close the knowledge gap instead of what you've just done is you've excused any any man or woman or anyone who says, you know what, I don't really want to solve sexism because I don't know what I don't know. I don't really want to solve racism because I don't know what I don't know. You know, I... it. I don't really need to be nice to migrants because I don't know what I don't know. It's it's utterly lazy. On the one hand, you're saying, oh, we can only look from our own viewpoint and we can't understand. Um, and that is giving you an excuse to just throw up your hands and say, well, you know what? I can't solve anything. What I do with all of this Okay, so his persona is now his authentic persona, as though he is like a little caterpillar um, that turned into a butterfly. Is this version of Paula Stone any more or less authentic than the version of Paula Stone that stood on his uh, at the altar on his wedding day and vowed to love, honor, and obey his wife? Was that a different version of Paula Stone? Um, you know, is was it a different version of Paula Stone that was at the birth of his children? Like, what are we supposed to believe here? That there was this shell of a man who turned into a woman and this is now the authentic one and the other one can be discarded. It doesn't make any sense. He has always been the same person. He's always been in the same body. Right, his may change his his um, his clothes, his hair, his name. He m might change his hormonal makeup. He may change. Um, he may have surgery on his body, but he's still essentially Paula. The brighter the light, the darker the shadow. And this little three-year-old or four-year-old boy supposedly knew he was transgender. What is it that he knew? Did he want to have long hair? Did he want to wear frilly dresses? Did he want to play with Barbies? What was it that that little boy knew? That his conservative parents wouldn't allow. When I came out as transgender in the seventies, I thought I was gay. That's quite sad actually. Last January I took a chance and called my dad and told him that I was gay. That's lovely. Months 
Exactly. Wouldn't it just be terrible, you know, to have, to be estranged from your parents over something like your hair or your name or your clothes? That is, it is really sad. Um, and it's really sad when I think about, you know, him as a little boy. I think about the other trans mums, like... Um, like uh, Kimberly Shapley and how she said that when her little boy Kai Shapley was a two-year-old and wanted to wear a dress and have long hair and have jewellery and whatnot, she thought he was gay and she tried out home conversion practices and she beat him so seriously that one day she found him praying to go to Jesus. You know, it's so tragic. Like, it, these things need not be so hard. Women are very emotional. That's quite sweet, isn't it? You know, I guess. That's quite nice, isn't it? You know, I do wonder, I wonder really, what is Paula's motivation in, uh, in wanting to transition and what he is going to be explaining to his father? Um, it seems like he'll just be talking about this authenticity um, nonsense. But, you know, is this... Is this just a little boy who wanted to have long hair and was prevented because he had this rigid upbringing and this, this rigid lifestyle that prevented him from exploring the idea that boys can have long hair and can wear dresses and can look pretty and have frills? And how might his life have been different if his parents had just let him you know, wear a frilly dress if you wanted to. His son. Okay. If willing to give up his power, so his power is like is like a patriarchal withholding of affection, and that's quite telling, isn't it? That Paula believes that this that that's not abuse, that that's actual power, and that that is what's what male power is is withholding. Okay, so last thoughts. Um, Paula Stone is a man, has always been a man, 
and doesn't have any access to any special knowledge about what it's like to be a woman because he can't be a woman because we can't change sex. He seems to not want to take responsibility for the idea that he has, quote, transitioned and he's constructed a number of devices to avoid taking responsibility. So the call toward authenticity and the idea that women live terrible, terrible lives and if he wasn't compelled to somehow be a woman, then, you know, it doesn't make any logical sense for him to want to be a woman. In terms of what he told us about what it's like to be a woman, well, it seems like um, it, it was very superficial. So he talked about his clothes not fitting or his clothes not having pockets uh, and, um, and him starting a bunch of fights with people because they didn't uh, kowtow to his authority. So... Look, I'm, I'm not a man, and I, but I do observe men, and I don't necessarily think that being a man means have being listened to and being believed at all times, right? There's still a pecking order amongst men. So, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me. For me, I don't necessarily think of that as like a very a fundamentally female experience, and, you know, in any case, there are assertive women out there who don't necessarily, um, you know, experience being spoken down to on the regular. I think that his Christianity and, um, you know, it sounds like he's he's grown up. I don't really know what, a, what it's like to be in a mega church or to be a pastor on the TV, but it sounds like being in that really social conservative atmosphere has played a huge role in his life i have seen another ted talk that he did with his son about the son coming to terms with you know the transition between um yeah the transition to being paula so his son is also a pastor and so it sounds like it's a huge part of his life, this really um, socially conservative and religious um, uh, situation. I just want to be really clear here. I don't necessarily equate Christian and conservative, right? I know that there are a lot of Christians out there who are like quite uh, welcoming of different expressions and they're welcoming of people having long hair or wearing different clothes or they're welcoming of gays and lesbians and they're welcoming of transgender people as well. So, you know, I think there's a tendency to say, you know, like the conservative Christian and lump those two things together. He clearly comes from a conservative Christian background, right, where it was not just Christian, but their livelihoods, clearly depended on it his father is a pastor he's a pastor his son is his friends are so they've got to be living those values and they've got to be seen to be living those values and they're clearly very conservative as well so <laughs> uh, I think that's played a huge role in his life and I think it might be one of the reasons why, as a young child, he knew that he wanted to do something different and he wasn't, he didn't pursue that. And perhaps it would have been, his life would have been really different today if he'd just been allowed to wear the dress. Um, that's very sad. But that doesn't mean that we should be letting Paula Stone gaslight us about what it is like to be a woman because he doesn't know. All right, that's been a mammoth effort. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm Kit Kowalski. Please like, share and subscribe and all of that. And if you like this video, please do comment and I, I will try to do another reaction video.
as a follow-up.